Welcome to the Health Cast. I'm your host, Marley Smith, and today I have the privilege of sitting down and talking to Dr. Tashmin Viseru. She is a registered pediatrician currently practicing in South Africa. She obtained her medical degree from the University of Witwatersrand and has been working in the field for over 18 years. There is definitely a big learning curve when it comes to first-time parents and bringing home that baby for the very first time. Parents try to prepare as much as possible and have so, so many questions. Today, we are going to be covering some of those most frequently asked questions with the help of a registered pediatrician, Dr. Tashmin Besiru. Welcome to the Health Cast. Hi, Mary, and thank you for having me. It really is lovely to have you here today. I am not a mom yet, but I've always found the conversations regarding parenting and the questions first-time parents have very interesting. Dr. Basiri, you mentioned earlier that you are a parent of two kids and you have a wealth of knowledge in the field. As first-time parents prepare for this journey, are there any myths or misconceptions regarding parenting you'd like to set straight for us? Yes, I think a lot of people want, they say it takes a, a village to raise a child, and that's great too, because everybody's going to give advice to your parents. Unfortunately, I think in the medical field, some of that advice is really good, and some of that advice can be a little bit old school, and that's where the pediatrician comes in in terms of debunking those myths that happen. So all I can say to parents is you need to listen to a lot of it, a lot of advice, a lot of people are giving you what they think should be done with your baby. But at the end of the day, it's your baby and they don't know any better. So that, that's the good thing for parents to know. So there's nothing about doing parenthood the right way. There is no right way. As long as you can keep your child alive, that's all good for them. Yeah, I've heard you can prepare as much as you want, but you're definitely going to learn like, on the job, as you can say. Now, we know that babies eat a lot while they're little. I mean, they eat on average, I think, every three hours. Is there a way for, for first-time parents to ensure that their babies are getting adequate nutrition? And in your opinion, should all babies be breastfed? Yes, of course. Breastfeeding is what we try to promote globally. And uh, even if it's just a lostrum that babies get right in the beginning, where they start to suckle, or even if moms are starting to get colostrum, even prior to delivery, you know, just trying to save that. So if you're in the, in the shower and you're, and you're pressing on your little, you know, breasts, and then all of a sudden these little beautiful droplets appear, that can happen way before even a baby is actually delivered. And, and some moms will keep that in the freezer, and then when babies come out, they have that available for them. But we want babies to be breastfed as much as possible because nobody can replicate that beautiful, you know, formulation of breast milk. So, yes, we want babies to feed us, you know, free, um, on the breast as much as we can. But in some instances, that's not going to be possible. And formula is not poison. It's been formulated to match breast milk as much as possible. And that is, uh, you know, the option that would have to happen if breastfeeding for whatever reason, whether it's a mom reason or a baby reason is not able to be done, formula takes the face of that. In terms of whether to know whether your child is getting enough or not, we normally talk about breastfeeding. When, when this is a breastfed infant, we talk about breastfeeding on demand. So that's whenever your baby wants to eat, that's when you're going to feed it. So whether that's every 45 minutes, whether it's every three hours, that's how it is. And that's why we call it breastfeeding on demand because we don't actually know what calories that particular baby has had for each feed. And that can change based on what the mom is eating and what, what the mom's hydration status is. So three hours is a, is a very relative term. I mean, now that we have clocks that are part of our lives, we're always looking at the clock and we have apps to document how much of time the baby is spending on the boob, et cetera. But in terms of how much to know whether your baby's fed, your, your baby will feed on the breast until they satisfied. So that's anything between 15 to 20 minutes when you first starting to breastfeed to five minutes when they're well established and happy and that flow is going quite nicely. Whereas when you have a formula fed infant, that baby can feed every three hours like clockwork because they get the same calories for every feed. 
and three hours is a normal physiological gastric emptying time. So that's a guideline to use for every three hours. And that's what we do. And each baby is going to be unique and different. So that's just a guide. But as, as I said, the breastfeeding baby can feed anytime they want to, as long as they fed. And they'll be going off to what we call a milk coma. So you breastfeed them till they fast. And that's what we want. From a formula fed baby, there's a recommended guideline in terms of how much to feed them. So they'll happily go to sleep and do almost a two and a half, three hour cycle before they're ready to feed again. Now, we all know that what goes in must come out. I'm sure you get this question a lot, but what can parents is expect to see in their baby's nappies and what is considered normal and not? So I like to talk about what is called poop milestones. And we all very much, you know, we, we're always looking at whether our child is getting to a particular milestone. And that's the same thing in terms of stools as well. So from the very beginning, last poop that the baby would make on day one and day two and pretty much almost day three of life is something called meconium, which is a very black, sticky, charry, disgusting looking substance that would come out when they first start getting their guts moving. And that is pretty normal. That's what you'll have. It's extremely difficult to clean off. So you have to go quite a while in terms of trying to get it up. And it's very sticky. And essentially, it is all the ingested skin cells, and everything else that's within the amniotic fluid that has been digested over those nine months in that gut. And that's what tends to come out. So the benefit to parents is that it doesn't, it's not a stinky diaper that you plus going to have when it comes out. So that's the only benefit of having that sticky poo in the first few days. And once the baby is starting to feed and milk is coming in by about day three, day four, that color is going to go to your nice greeny, sticky kind of milk. And then it's going to turn into a nice, nubby, what we call a yellow mustard color. So that's what we expect the transition of the pooch to be as they're starting to get milk in. So on day five, day four, day five, when you know the milk has come in for mom, that's what we want to expect, that nice yellow mustard too. And now you know you set to your baby's getting the right type of milk and everything goes well. So those are your poop milestones, and that's what you expect in the first week of life to have in that diaper. From the consistency as well, and I get that question quite a lot. So you know, we often say, oh, I found this in the diaper, and it looks so seedy and whatever. So that's also an important one, because poop can look very sticky and gloopy in the beginning, and then it goes into this yellow mustardy color that's very seedy looking. And almost like curdled milk, which is exactly what it is. And that's part of the digestive process. And when you have a nice good heat coming out from mom and breast milk is nice and, and populated with all the beautiful proteins and fats that we eat, that poo will generally look quite see. I mean, and that's what you expect to have for every poo. In terms of when you're having a well watery poop, that's also quite normal. So a yellowy watery poop that pretty much soaks into the diaper is also a normal poop. Because you often get, say, you know, get a, a question where, oh, my baby's having diarrhea. It's actually not diarrhea. It's just a watery poop that they have that soaks right into the diaper. And that, again, depends on what mom's eating for the day. So if she's had, you know, not much to have, to have eating that day, if the calorie count's not very high, there's not much waste that actually is coming out. And that's when you have that normal kind of watery poop diaper. In terms of frequency of stool, so once you establish these, with breast milk, we talked about the rule of 10. So with a breastfed baby, when they're feeding, they feed often. So they can have up to 8 to 10 feeds a day. And that's exactly what the type of diapers you're going to get. So you're ex anticipating to have 8 to 10 dirty diapers in a day with a breastfed baby. But the reverse of that's also true, where you could have one dirty diaper in 10 days. And that's a very common with breastfeeding babies. They tend not to poo as often sometimes. And that's because they absorbing all their nutrition, and there's not much waste products to, from the breast milk to have in a diaper. So that's the range that they can do. So, you know, often you'll get, oh, my baby's constipated. They haven't gone to the, you know, haven't had a dirty diaper in three days. And that's normal for a breastfed baby. They can do that. It will add to the little bit of discomfort they have. But at the end of the sixth day, all of a sudden, you'll have this, what I like to call a tsunami excuse it, excuse the term, but it's a hue that comes after the six days, but the consistency is still very nice and watery with the seedy bits in it. 
and that's absolutely a normal pee. If you pass this uh, at poo on the sixth day and it's looking like a few rocks in those diapers, then that's definitely a constipated baby and that becomes a concern for a parent. So, and that's what breastfeeding. If you have a formula fed baby, that baby is not going to pass a poo more than once or twice in a day. And sometimes the formula fed baby will go three days and every third day they may pass a pee. And that's because the formula is a lot stronger. It takes a lot more digestive processes to break down. And therefore, the elimination period tends to be a bit longer. And the consistency of that poo as well. It's not going to be similar to how breast milk poo would be, but it would be almost like a, a toothpaste consistency in terms of when it comes out. So that's what we anticipate coming out from the other end when we breastfeeding and formula feeding our babies. It is a lot. I didn't even know um, all of that was possible. <laughs> so I'm definitely also learning. So on topic, Dr. Basiru, for babies experiencing diaper rashes then frequently or more frequently, how would you determine the difference between a minor skin irritation and something that requires medical attention? Yeah, so it's obviously a common thing to have. And in now in our modern area that we uh, are living in, we have disposable diapers and that's very readily available for our parents. Although we still have, you know, the, uh, some of them that are still using our cloth nappies. So in a nappy dermatitis, the, the longer the urea is in contact with that poor little bottom, that's when you're going to get an irritation. So in our modern day, as I said, our, our disposable diapers, they would absorb a lot of that urine away from the skin. And you have your bum creams that you're applying as a preventative strategy. So that's what we would not expect to having a diaper rash in a normal baby. You don't expect to have it. But if that diaper is going to be there for a bit longer and mom happened to see through that diaper change, that's okay. And then you might get a bit of a, a red spotty rash that occurs. The other risk factor that happens when you're having that diaper rash is sometimes you can have a bit more acidic pool that gets passed. And that acidity from the poo ends up causing that irritation in the diaper area. And that's when that becomes a little bit more concerning. So why are you having an acidic poo? Was mum on a tomato binge the previous day and breast milk is quite acidic and that's irritated the baby's tummy. So those are the factors we have to kind of look at in terms of what's happening with the pee. So when we're looking at diaper rashes, what's nice to know in terms of most of the preparations from a bum cream point of view have the lovely ingredients of having zinc and castor oil in them. And that is quite a nice protective barrier, but it also helps the skin heal. And, and that's what you would probably need to do with most diaper rashes. It's just put it on nice and thick and make sure it's being used a lot more frequently for it to settle. When the diaper rash is not just a diaper rash, what you will see is quite a lot of sweaty lesions that are happening that tend to extend beyond the nappy area. So for instance, if it's starting to be a fungal rash where you get a, a nappy capitisis, you end up having what we call the rash within the folds of the baby. So those beautiful, lovely folds in that nappy area, that's the area that would be more red and more irritated. And you tend to get what we call satellite lesions where you'll have these little red spots that start to extend into the abdomen or next to the tummy area. And that's a little bit more concerning because you shouldn't be having urine that's in that area. Um, and therefore, that rash is very distinct. It's, it's very different from your normal nappy, nappy rash that you would get. So the nappy rash is wherever we, we would be. And that's where you expect to have the irritation. If it's starting in the folds or in the tummy area, that's unlikely to be just a simple diaper rash and needs further, a further look at in terms of going forward. So in terms of the brands, doctor, that you like to recommend, you mentioned zinc and castor oil ointments and then as well, uh, maybe an antifungal cream. Is that the go-to creams or ointments you would recommend for all first-time parents? So, uh, yes, I mean, there's so many preparations on the market, but as all the bum creams have the standard kind of preparations where they would have zinc and castor oil and they work perfectly well. And then your antifungals, obviously from a pharmacy point of view or a doctor point of view, those might need prescriptions. 
But sometimes the friendly pharmacist is able to assist if we know it's a more fungal kind of rash and that's an easy pain to apply. You have to do a full seven days and then that completes the treatment for a fungal infection. Then in terms, doctor, of keeping your baby as healthy as possible, I think everybody after COVID is a lot more aware of hygiene practices, hand washing, wearing masks. Are there practical ways to boost your baby's immune system or or health in the beginning, the early stages of their life? Of course, we want to say breastfeeding is best. That is going to be the highest concentration of antibodies that a baby's going to get. So that colostrum or breastfeeding. So we want to try and get a, a, that breastfeeding done from the beginning, start up well. And then obviously that's going to impart a whole lot of immunity to, to your child at the end of the day. In the first five years of life, the children are going to have infection. It's the way they build their system. They'll have um, on average, uh, a, a five-year-old would have been exposed to about 80 different viral infections by the time they're five years. So they will get sick, and it's just about how they recover and how quickly they recover. So in terms of helping them and boosting their immunity, we want a healthy diet, of course. So starting from the very early ages of introduction of solids, you want all your natural fruits and vegetables, etc., to get all the natural sources of vitamins in. I believe in doing more natural kind of eating. So if you want to give your baby more vitamin C, then cut up more oranges, etc., and give them the strawberries that are high in vitamin C. So our synthetic things we try and keep for the more complicated child. So the one that's a picky eater who doesn't really want to pick up mean veg, etc., that's the child that actually needs a little bit more supplementation from a multivitamin point of view. But minerals in general have a more stimulation to the immune system than vitamins do. And minerals are the things that most children would be deficient in. For instance, those are your zinc, your molybdenum, chromium, and iron. And those are not in your normal preparations of multivitamins. They, they are specialized minerals that occur. So those where you're chopping for a multivitamin and mineral, that's what you want to look for in terms of, does this have this extra zinc, this extra monobidium and chromium and selenium that the children do they get, get deficient in when they're not eating all their fruits and vegetables. So vegetables are important for you. And the more raw they are, the better us that is going to be. You don't want to cook the life out of them as we don't always want to do and try and get it in and hide it as much as you can and whatever you can. So don't eat in general things you want to do, but just in terms of the baby in from the, if you're looking from birth going onwards, the first six weeks of any baby's life is when they are at most risk of catching anything that could actually kill them eventually. So those six weeks, it sounds awful, but those six weeks, we normally say if you're going to have visitors over, et cetera, you become a lot more strict in terms of what we allow into a household. Because those first six weeks, that baby has absolutely no immune system. So coming in, if their visitors coming in, we want proper hand washing before you're touching the baby. If you've got a little sniffle, you rather advise your visitors to stay at home. Don't expose your baby to that. In your own household, there may be siblings and there may be other, other people living with you that have issues. And we ask them then to wear a mask. If the other sibling is quite old, or you can try as much as possible to keep them away from the little one, but it's not going to happen. <laughs> So you want to try as much as possible to try and separate them if you can. And as I said, mask wearing is still very much a, a go-to thing. As that child grows, it's the same principles, right? Till they get to a year old, where they're still developing the immune system. And if you breastfed, that's going to work awesomely because you're getting all those exposures via you to them with the antibodies you give that child. And then in that first year of life, you are going to put things into their mouths. And that's how you actually gain an immune system. So we were all, we were all very worried about cleaning and sanitizing surfaces, etc. And that's all fair and well. But at the end of the day, when your baby starts corning, those are the germs that are actually stimulating to your baby's gut and immune system via the gut. And that's why we actually do what we do. We are constantly putting things in our mouth, you're calling, we're using our hands. We're touching the dog and touching into our mouth because we don't know anything about hand washing. And that's actually a good thing because it actually stimulates your immune system. And over cleaning and over sanitizing is actually not a good thing 
in a way, because of that factor, you actually want your child to be exposed to those drums because it becomes a way of natural immunity eventually. So the, the panicked parent true, he calls and says, they've gone into the garden and eaten the dog food. Well, that's okay. <laughs> Especially if they haven't been exposed to all those germs. Absolutely, doctor. Still on the topic of symptoms your baby may experience, because as you mentioned, it is inevitable that your baby is going to get sick. Is there a way to differentiate between regular fever and, say, a fever that needs more medical attention? Yeah, so fever is our body's inborn defense system. And often mm. parents get quite afraid when they see a temperature because it's something that you know should be, you should be worried about, et cetera. And I think most of the, most of the education programs that will tell you if your child's got a fever, you need to take you know, action immediately, et cetera. But in all fairness, it's, your immune, it's that child's immune system that's starting to kick in. And that's a good thing because it's literally like boiling a pot of water to take out the germs. That's exactly what your body's trying to do in terms of the blood. Raises the temperature to kill off those viruses or kill off those bacteria. When you talk about what is a regular fever, any fever is, is, a, is a problem. So when you have, often we say that uh, fevers go with teething. That's not actually a, a true phenomenon that happens. Teething itself doesn't cause the temperature. It's the inflammation that actually causes the temperature. So we, we, we have to be very careful in calling a regular fever and an, an abnormal fever. So the first thing we have to find is what is a fever? So any temperature above 37.8 would be regarded as a temperature. So it also depends on which thermometer you're using. So we have a number of different types of thermometers that are now on the market with COVID error. Everything's gotten a lot more advanced and a lot more easier, in fact, to take a temperature. So you have the infrared ones that just go onto your forehead where you either press it onto it or do it from a distance and getting a temperature. Here's one that would go into the here. And then your traditional on with the arm or in the mouth temperature. So all those ones, we generally would say anything above 37.8 would be regarded as a proper temperature. And that needs to then look at the child. So if you've got a temperature, for instance, post the vaccination, so if you've gotten, that's basically your immune system getting stimulated and that's why your body had the temperature. The normal thing to do is expose your child, make sure that they don't have too many layers on, and then start to what we call tempered spans. So you wipe them down with a clock and that's a warm water clock. You wipe to simulate sweat. That's basically what that whole procedure does. And when you sweat, you tend to lose off your feet. And if you're not successful at getting a temperature down with just the two basic measures, then your paracetamol, acetaminophen, those type of medication would then come into play. If you cannot get a temperature down in any way, that is telling you that your immune system is spicy something. And no matter what you throw at it, it's so going to try and get that temperature up because there's a nasty little bug left around. So, and that's one of the things that I tell my parents to feel a little bit better about is that if you can control the temperature with paracetamol, that means that it's okay. You've got it under control. The virus or bacteria is in the system, but your body is fighting and you're trying to assist, assist that child in fighting it. But if you cannot control the temperature, that's a little bit of concern because either there's a known nasty or infection, and that can will be here in terms of seeing somebody for it. So that's, and the first symptom often with viral illnesses and in children under the age of five will be temperature. So it will be one of your first signs. The answer temperature is very well established after the first 24, 30, 28 hours. Then you might see a little bit of a snucky nose, a little bit of a conostrophy. And in some instances, after the temperature is eased, you'll see a rash that shakes out. So those are the most common things that most of kids are going to present with. And often, as a pediatrician, what happens to half layers, the panic sets in with the cancer chest, and then the patient comes to the TCS. When they see an stack, she hasn't developed any other signs yet. She was very difficult to say, okay, you know, we're just going to watch the temperature, or we need to cheat the temperature for something that's starting to develop because the illness is still developing. 
So often I tell parents that if you can bring down the temperature and you continue to look at that temperature every four to six hours, then you got control of it. And pretty much most viral infections after 72 hours, the temperature goes away, the body's fought the infection, and then you get very mild symptoms at home, which is the stuffy nose, congestion, and cough. So pretty. 72 hours seems to be that safe period where you can manage temperatures for sufficiently before seeking care. And as I said, if you cannot get a temperature down or your child already has symptoms that are sent in in terms of a donkey on and easing here, et cetera, get the kind of the upper concern. Appetite is also another one that goes under the symptom. If your child's got a chip for and they're not eating or drinking, that doesn't matter whether you can get the temperature down or not. That still also needs care because that child will be hungry a lot faster. So often it depends on the age of the child. As, you know, a seven and eight year old, you can kind of force to drink, but a seven month old, on the other hand, is not going to put anything in their mouth if they've got a tonsillitis thing. So I think it's, a, it, it's, it's, there's, there's no such thing as a regular fever, if I can say that. But this is what we want to do in terms of the warning sign. What, what, see, what do you need to see more hair for in terms of a day or sign? Just still on the topic of keeping your baby as comfortable as possible during their early stages of their lives. Is there a way to eliminate or practical measures you can implement to help babies with gas discomfort or constipation? Yes. Yeah, so... A baby is going to learn for the first time the sensation of needing to poop and feeding a cramp. And those are normal feelings to have, except they distress parents a lot more than they actually distress the child. So it's very important, obviously, to, again, remember what are we feeding our baby? Is it a breastfed baby? Is it a formula-fed baby? If you are having that discomfort on day six when you haven't passed a poop, the nice thing that you can do from a natural point of view, is get your baby to move. So as we know, you are not exactly moving very much. So we want to try and exercise those legs and get their abdomen to move a little bit so the gut starts to be active. So we call it bicycling off the legs. So it's pretty much trying to get them to almost simulate like you're riding a bicycle. And doing those type of exercises definitely assist the gut and also get rid of gas a lot better. So, and then... As you hear that gas is feet, you have a happier being all of a sudden. So that's the first things to do. So just playing around, there's lots of demonstrations that you can get on YouTube. But essentially, the bicycling is the very best thing to do. And basically turning them over and having your hand on their tummy and holding them that, and that way as well, applying a little bit of pressure to that abdomen. And that also helps them to release the gas quite nicely. So, excuse me, gas feet feet would come from two things. The one is from the fact that when they swallow, they swallow air, and that air rinse feet enters into the bowel system. And the second is from actual fermentation of the milk that sits in the gut. So, the preventative ways obviously get the burps out. So, burping is a very important thing for, for especially the first six weeks of life to get those burps out because as they enter into the bowel system, that's what makes them quite gassy and that becomes a trapped wind in the bowel and causes a spasm and an unhappy baby. So getting the buffs out are very important. Buffing, there's lots of strategies to do it. But the most important thing to remember is that you have to keep that baby's esophagus nice and straight. And that is the key to any buffing position, whether it be over the shoulders, on your lap, turning the baby to the side, etc. It's trying to support their neck and making sure that esophagus is not very stumpled. And when that's straight, the burp is much easier to come out. And that's a very good mechanism uh, in terms of preventative air into that gut. The second is fermentation. So our breast milk and most of your popular brands of formula would have lactose as the main sugar. So breast milk also has lactose in it. And if that gut is not breaking down the lactose fast enough, that lactose then ferments and release, releases gas. It's like making beer in your gut to the tree. So that's what ends up causing all that gas in you so well. So to prevent it, as I said, the buffing, if it's like related to the fermentation of the, of the actual milk in the gut, then there are preparations that are more herbal for babies to use. Any sort of ripe water that has a, a, the herbal component of dill in it. 
And that relaxes the gut and helps to dissipate that gas that's in you. So those are any of the right watches that are generally on the market. And those tinctures have been around for hundreds of years, some of them. But when you're picking one, always look at the ingredients and make sure that it's alcohol free. We don't want our kids to learn. And having a sip of wine is quite relaxing from early on. Well, I always say go with the alcohol free ones. And there's lots more market now that have been going on to that direction. And these preparations are horrible and they do help. And with that discomfort that babies have in the beginning and that as they grow up from it and learn to know that feeling and sensation of pooing, they end up getting a lot better from it. Dr. Vasir, I think I will definitely keep you here the whole day if I had to discuss all the topics that first-time parents want to know about and the questions that they have. And I do take my hat off to all pediatricians because it's not easy having patients that can't actually speak. I mean, you guys really have to have immense knowledge and experience in the field to actually know what's wrong with those little ones. Just for the sake of our listeners as well, could you tell us what inspired you to pursue a career, not just a medical career, but to pursue a career in pediatrics? Yeah, so pediatrics, we often get asked that question, why peds? Um, I think I, I like children a lot better than adults. And it's the joy of knowing that if you walk into the ward and you're treating an adult patient and you go, Mr. Smith, how are you today? Oh, and you'll hear Mr. Smith complaining about, oh, yes, you know, this is still sore and that is still sore and I'm just not feeling myself yet. But a child, on the other hand, who's been sick for a while, you put them into the ward and two days later you walk in there They've got the biggest smile. They are eating everything they see. And you know they're ready to go home. There's, there's no existence of just being a child. But also, they, they, they bounce back so quickly and so dearly. And, and, and that just is absolutely awesome. I, I think children are, are the best little things that you can ever, ever interact with. They, they're their own little species in terms of how they interact with people and how they perceive the world. But also... In terms of newborns, I get the opportunity of being in a room where the miracle of life comes to me. And that is that nobody, I mean, every baby that comes into the world is different. That cry that they make, the first cry is different. And they all look different, obviously. But it's such an amazing thing to see a child take a breath for the first time. And I always thank parents for choosing me to be part of that journey from the very beginning. Because, you know, to see that, that beautiful life come into the, into the world is, is, is something that, yeah, an experience that is next to none. I really want to thank you so, so much for taking the time to talk to me today. That's fine. Thank you so much for having me. That's it for today regarding some of the most frequently asked questions first-time parents may have before bringing home that baby for the very first time, this podcast is powered by GlobeMade UK, giving you access to the best doctors, treatments and medical specialists worldwide.